Good morning, Lake Point Church. It's Pastor Jesse just welcoming you here this morning. Just want to uh, let you know that we still have our Connect Points that will be happening every night this week, uh, Monday through Friday. Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, you'll have a recorded Connect Point that you'll be able to watch either on Facebook or on our website at lakepointcc.org. And on Thursday and Friday, we're going to be celebrating uh, the end of Holy Week live. Uh, so you'll be able to tune in on Facebook live uh, on Thursday night and Friday night for those devotions. We're hoping that you are enjoying these recordings and you're jumping online and seeing them. You can always get the services, even past services, on our website uh, or on our Facebook page. Make sure that you like our YouTube page as well through the church and Facebook so that you can get notifications of things that are happening and other uh, devotions and things that are happening online right away. So we just again want to thank you for joining us. We are praying for you. We pray that you're praying for us as well. We hope that you are blessed and that you are safe. Is that all right? Good morning. Welcome to this Palm Sunday. We're so happy that you are taking time to be with us and that we can provide you with some worship and teaching. We want to celebrate Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest. You're welcome to worship at home with us and sing your hearts out. We love it.
Oh, Jesus, if we're honest with ourselves, we would agree that we are sinful, that we do fall short of your glory, that we don't measure up to your standard. And yet when we freely admit that, and when we look to you and to your Father, we don't see the response we would tend to expect. We don't see judgment. We don't see condemnation. We don't see shame. Instead, we see mercy. We see grace. We see you with kindness reaching out to us, with your arms wide open, with an expression of love pouring out from your heart. So, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace, your amazing grace. We thank you for your love that you show to us. And we thank you for your kindness expressed by your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you for that. We're so very grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen wanted to take communion together this morning, so I'm glad that you are with us and viewing this. There are two ways that you can do this. As I've said for most of the week, you are uh, more than welcome to go and grab some grape juice or some crackers or uh, anything that you, would get, you can take to be a part of communion, or you can let me stand in place for you and for your family and for the church as the lead pastor, I will also be taking communion uh, for us in your place, if that's how you would like to do that. So go ahead now and let's take the bread. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and after he had given thanks for it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Father, we just look to you today during this time. We look to you and we focus on you, and we have a hope and a trust in what you are doing in us and through us. I pray that you would guide us and that you would bless us and that you would help us, Lord God, that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, not to fear, not to worry, but have a confident hope in what you are doing and not only your people but in your church and in this nation and in this world. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us through it, that you would help us to learn what we need in it right now, that you would be with all of those who are in the medical field, that you would help them and keep them safe as well as they are on the front lines of this war. Help them, Lord God, I pray. Keep them safe. And for all those who are sick, those of them who are dealing not only with this virus, but with other things as well. There are still people with cancer that need healing, and there are still so many other ailments that we need uh, to be praying for as well. So help us, Lord Jesus, during this time. Father God and Holy Spirit, guide us, I pray, in your name.
Amen and amen. You can see this morning I am going to be teaching on communion, and the title of my message is Come to the Table. It's a, maybe a strange thing to do on Palm Sunday. Typically on Palm Sunday, we will have our palms and we have a, a Palm Sunday message uh, in celebration. And I do want to celebrate Palm Sunday as well. I want to remember and reflect on what Jesus did, his triumphal entry, coming into Jerusalem, walking in uh, on a donkey, riding in on a donkey, Coming in in this uh, servant way, not in a huge, uh, like on a white horse with fanfare and pomp and circumstance, but instead he came in as a servant on a donkey in his triumphal entry. And what I love to see in this picture and in this thinking is that people began to stop and they began to look and, and they saw Jesus coming in on someone else's donkey, it wasn't even his, coming in in this humble way as the prince of the universe, as the, the son of God coming in. And they began to lay down their uh, garments and their coats and other things so that as he on the donkey rode over them, they began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And it's a great picture because we have people at the beginning of the week bringing him praise and bringing him glory and bringing him honor. And that's how it really should have been for the rest of the week and even into the weekend as we know what happens with his crucifixion. But this is the start of Holy Week. Palm Sunday is the start of Holy Week. And every day what I would like us to do is reflect on different parts of Jesus's uh, each day, the rest of his life, the end of his life, the last few days here. So you can join us uh, for live devotions on Thursday and on Friday of this week, but we have Holy Thursday and we have Good Friday coming up. So we'll be looking at those different things. But at this morning, what I want to really focus on are the different uh, uh, aspects and the different parts of what communion is. Perhaps you've grown up in more of a liturgical setting, uh, even Catholic, so you know this is not just called communion, it's called Eucharist. And some of us even know that this is called the Last Supper, Jesus' Last Supper with His disciples. It's found in actually four different uh, verses in the Bible. It's found in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's also found in 1 Corinthians. It's one of the very few times that Paul kind of uh, harmonizes with the Gospels in giving uh, uh, something here in, in terms of communion. It doesn't happen very often with Paul. He was kind of writing his own thing and doing his thing about Jesus Christ, but this is one of the very few times that he actually harmonizes with the other Gospels. It isn't found in the book of John. <clears throat> John was always doing his own thing and writing his own thing completely. So John doesn't necessarily mention the Last Supper in this way, but to give you some context, Jesus washing the disciples' feet according to John, happened after this Last Supper. So once again, just like riding in on a donkey, on a horse, on a donkey back coming into town, in the same way we see Jesus being humble during the Last Supper and washing his disciples' feet. So what I have actually done, and I hope that you're okay with this, but I've taken Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians, and I actually took them and I wrote them all out uh, on uh, my computer. I typed them all out, and then I took different aspects from each one of them, and I overlaid them. I put them together, and the parts that matched up perfectly, I just left in there, and the parts that were different, I also left in and created this new little script, if you will. I didn't rewrite scripture at all, but I created a script that I would like to share with you by overlaying all of these different verses. Now listen to this. Jesus said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night he was betrayed, and when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles were with him. 
Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes when I will drink it new in the kingdom of God. And as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it, gave thanks, and broke it in pieces, giving it to his disciples, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, and gave thanks, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is shed for you and for many. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. And they all drank from it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So it's a little different than maybe that we you hear uh, even this morning if you've been taking communion with us. It's a little different to hear all the different uh, aspects of the scriptures all coming together, but they are in harmony together. They are in harmony, and they really do uh, and show three different aspects, three different purposes of communion. And those three purposes are to remember Christ's sacrifice, to reflect on the promise and to restore our future hope. Those are the three purposes, and now I want to take a look at each one of them. Let's go ahead and first, let's look at the elements. You can see here, I have two different uh, kinds of elements here. I have uh, probably what it looked like with Jesus and his disciples, and what we have done today. We We definitely have some wood here and some brass here. Not as elegant, uh, more uh, resourceful over here, and a little more elegant, giving a little uh, more of a purpose on this side. Uh, But Jesus uh, giving communion, when we have the elements, there are two important things, of course, with them, and that is going to be the bread and the wine. Let's look at the scripture. Jesus said, for I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed, and when the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve disciples. See, the hour had come. The hour had come. This was a time that was ordained by God. This time was ordained by him. This wasn't an accident. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't as if God uh, didn't know what was going to happen. It isn't even though Jesus was going to happen. They knew what was on its way, what was coming, that crucifixion was going to happen a week later. So the hour had come, and this time was ordained by God himself. And this was the night now in which he was betrayed. He knew, Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed by those sitting around the table. He knew about Judas and he knew what was going to happen with him. He knew that Peter himself would deny him. And really, almost all of those men didn't show up at at the cross when Jesus was there. They all took turns betraying him, just as if we have done ourselves, all taken turns betraying him. And yet, even though it was the hour and he knew what was coming, he knew that they were going to betray him. And yet, Jesus still wanted to be with them. Jesus still wanted to be with them, even though he knew what was happening. With fervent desire, the scripture says, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He desired to eat with them. Jesus wanted to be with them regardless of their sin and regardless of their betrayal. And the same is with us. 
we have to see this as well, that Jesus in the same way wants to be with us even though we are sinners and we are betrayers. He still sets that aside and says, I still love you and want to be with you. I still have the desire to have Passover and communion with you. And they were good Jewish boys, all of them. And so having the Passover was actually a celebration. It's a major Jewish holiday that they celebrated every year. <clears throat> it's associated with the great exodus where the, they were they enslaved in ancient Egypt. And then God took 10 plagues and put 10 plagues against the Egyptians and had inflicted them. Uh, and, and then they were on the 10th the tenth plague, which was that the firstborn of every household was going to be killed because of the uh, Pharaoh was not allowing slavery to end. The Passover was instituted, and you can find it in Exodus chapter 12, during that last plague, during a plague, and what God had commanded the Jewish people to do, he told the Hebrews, he wanted them to kill a lamb, a spotless lamb that had no flaws, and take the blood of that lamb and paint it on the doorpost over their home where they were living. And this blood, the scripture says, will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this is where we get the name Passover, because that blood that was put on the frame was for God to see that that was a person having the blood that was a Hebrew and he passed over. And this became a memorial then. This became a time. And uh, the, the Jews added a feast to it. Uh, and it became a time of remembering what God had done. That he had passed over, passed over them and kept them safe. This mark then caused the Spirit of the Lord to pass over them. And this is where we get the name of that holiday. Jesus and his disciples then were celebrating together. They were celebrating the memorial that God had saved them thousands of years before. And Jesus, it says, was excited to celebrate with them. He was excited to be with them and celebrate. And the scripture continues. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes, when I will drink it in the new in the kingdom of God. And as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it, gave thanks, and broke it into pieces, giving it to the disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. Let's speak a little bit about uh, the bread and the wine. They're both symbolic in nature, all the way back to Genesis, when there was a king of Salem named Melchizedek, who brought out bread and wine when Abraham, Father Abraham, was visiting him in his kingdom. He brought out some bread, and he brought out some wine, and he celebrated with Abraham, Abraham's arrival there. And Melchizedek was uh, an archetype for Jesus. He was kind of a foreshadowing of what the Messiah was. So even back in Genesis, we can see that communion and the elements are being taken. And Jesus himself talked a lot about the bread. He taught a lot about bread. In fact, there are certain times in Scripture where uh, you can remember it happened once or twice where Jesus actually fed 5,000 people. And it, he was feeding the 5,000 people. They were sitting on the hillside listening to him preach and they began to get hungry and maybe Jesus even himself started to get hungry and said it's time for uh, dinner I know that I've ended some of my sermons a little early so I could get home and eat as well no just kidding but but we know that bread is a common symbol and it means something that we do when we are hungry it, it kind of signifies to nourish ourselves so Jesus is sitting on the hillside 
and he actually tells his uh, uh, disciples to take the loaves and distribute them. And this is what it says in the scripture. Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. And this is a foreshadowing. He does this to feed the people, but it's almost word for word how they describe communion because he gives thanks for the bread before he gives it to his disciples and distributes it. It's the same with us today, this spiritual nourishment. God is still, through Jesus Christ, giving thanks and breaking uh, this bread so that we can come together to the table. Jesus actually declares uh, a little bit after this when he's sitting with his disciples, he declares in John chapter 6 that I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And it's within this declaration of being the bread that Jesus gives a foreshadowing to the disciples of uh, their coming to the table together. It's the first time that we see Jesus bringing them to the table. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Just a few verses later, Jesus continues to teach on the bread. And when he pronounces uh, to the disciples, he says, in order for you to be a part of me, in order to, for you to be a part of what I am doing and the kingdom that I am going to be establishing, in order for you to do this, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And this was a radical teach. If I were to say to people at Lake Point on membership night, if you want to become a member of Lake Point, you must eat of my flesh and drink my blood, I can pretty much guarantee you we would have no members and we'd be closing our doors permanently and everybody would be gone. But yet Jesus looks at them and at this time, we're talking about about 3,000 disciples are following Jesus. The scholars believe that at a certain point at the pinnacle, there were about 3,000 disciples that were following Jesus and spreading a message and, and the hope that he was giving and letting people know. And so they're all sitting there on the hillside in this teaching and he says to them, if you want to be with me, if you want to be a part of me, you must do this cannibalistic act of drinking blood and eating flesh. And in fact, it was so radical. In fact, it was so difficult that one by one, disciples began to get up and walk away, grumbling. This is a hard teaching. This is, who, who can comprehend this? Why, why would he even say this? And they begin to, one by one, move away and leave Jesus. And not only leave him, but leave him permanently from his ministry, never to return. And Jesus doesn't even seem to be phased. He just looks at his disciples, the original 12 that are just sitting there, who are blinking at him, going, what? did you just do? We had a mega church. <laughs> we had everything that you had come for to establish. We are all sitting here and all of a sudden you just said, it's time to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we lost them all. And Jesus just looked at them and he said, are you going to leave me too? Are you going to leave me? Because this is a hard teaching. Jesus knew it was hard. Jesus knew it was difficult to understand. And yet he didn't shy away from it because it is still the truth. He foreshadows it to the Passover that night. He did months and months, maybe even a year before. And he wasn't talking even just about symbolically. He didn't say that. He didn't come out and say, oh, I was just talking symbolically. He just lets that sit there for a moment. And here's what I love the response from Simon Peter, who just looks at Jesus, and I, I can't imagine what's going through his mind, but he looks at Jesus and he said, where else would we go? <laughs> we, we have in our hearts, the 12 of us have established 
that you are the Messiah, that you are the son of the living God. Where else can we go? And it's in that moment that the 12 disciples actually locked on to Jesus because Jesus gave a difficult teaching and they remained. And this is true true for us today. This, what we're doing, when we have communion and we take the Eucharist and the elements and the different things, we have to know that if you are not a part of the church culture, this is a weird thing. It's not just crackers and juice. It's not just a good snack that we're taking during communion Sunday. But to other people, this is kind of a strange thing. And what we are actually remembering are Jesus' difficult words of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But why would he say that? Why would he say that? We know that Jesus was being symbolic. We know what he was saying now. But at the time, it was a difficult word. But the question still remains. Are you going to leave me too, said Jesus? Are you going to leave me when it gets difficult, when challenges arise, when difficult words are spoken? Are you yourself going to leave? Scripture goes on. Let's let's go back to the table. Let's go back to the table on Passover night. And Jesus took the cup. It was probably more like this cup than it was this cup. But Jesus took the cup after supper and gave thanks saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is shed for you and for many. Drink from it, all of you. And Jesus introduces the bread, and now he uh, introduces the wine. Wine is the other common symbol a common drink in Scripture. It's all throughout Scripture, uh, even found in the Old Testament, the ancient Scriptures into the New Testament. We see wine all throughout there. And just like Jesus calls himself the bread of life, he also calls himself the wine. In John chapter 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, it's not perfectly clear that he was speaking about a grapevine, but it's pretty much understood that he was talking about a vine that produces fruit because this is what it says in John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So just as though he had called himself the bread, he's also calling himself the vine and producing of the wine from a grape. And what's interesting about these is, yes, they are symbolic, but even more symbolic than just the wine and the bread is how they're actually made and how they get there. Think of it in terms of taking wheat and the transformation that must happen to create wheat into bread, or taking a grape fruit and then taking that and the transformation that happens to that in order for it to become juice when we look at the wine and we look at the bread we know that they represent great transformation a great transformation bread and wine go through a process where they transform And this is not only symbolic of Jesus' life where he went through a great transformation in terms of death and into life, but in the same way, we go through a transformation when we come to that vine or we come to the bread. We must go through a great transformation from who we once were into who we are now in him. So these things also represent great transformation. So when we take the communion, we are acknowledging this transformation that it happened in our lives. So coming to the table, coming and taking communion causes us, and here's the first point I want you to remember, it causes us to remember Christ's sacrifice. Coming to the table Coming and taking the bread and taking the wine causes us to remember the great sacrifice that Christ did for our lives by laying down his life. Remember Christ's sacrifice. 
The scripture continues. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Let's take a look at covenants for a moment. Covenants are made between two or more people. And a covenant, a covenant is a promise made between these people. We see covenants in the Old Testament. We see some covenants in the New Testament. We see uh, different things. It's, it's people basically shaking hands and making a promise. It's, and your word is bond. And what you say is going to happen. It's what you're going to do. You're promising it. But even more so, a covenant even has a spiritual element behind it than just writing your name on a page or saying, I'll repay you your debt. You are actually staking a spiritual as well as your physical life into doing it. And this is a covenant, this promise. It's created so that both parties in this covenant will remember, will remember what was said at that moment. So two or more people will make a covenant and then that will help and it will be a good time that if they forget, if someone forgets that what they were going to do, another person will say to them, remember, we are in covenant. So you may have forgotten, but I haven't forgotten. And so suddenly it's also a way of remembering promises to each other. And Jesus calls this uh, last supper, he calls communion with his disciples, the new covenant. This is the blood of a new covenant. What is Jesus talking about here? The new covenant is not only for us to remember the promises made, but listen to this. It's not only for us to remember Him, but it's also for Him to remember us. It's also when we take this to remind God of his promise to us. If it's a covenant, it reminds us of what he has done, but it also reminds him of who we are. Not necessarily what we've done, but what he's done for us. Look at what it says. Blow the trumpets in times of gladness, it says in Numbers 10. Sounding them at your annual festivals and at the beginning of each month and blow the trumpets over burnt offerings and peace offerings. The trumpets will remind your God of his covenant with you. I am the Lord your God. And remember my covenant, God said, which is between me and you. Every living creature of all flesh, he says back in Genesis. A covenant is not only for us to remember him, it is also used for him to remember us, to what he has done for us. And this becomes the covenant. We come to the table to remember Christ's sacrifice, but it is also for us to reflect on the promise, to reflect on the promise that he has given us, the promise of his sacrificial love, that he died for our sins and rose again. So when we get together, we are remembering, we remembering his sacrifice, but also reflecting on the promise. And they drank from it, continues the scripture. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You are announcing, you are remembering, you are reflecting, you are believing. You are believing that when you eat the bread and you drink from the cup, that you are having hope. You are having hope that God will fulfill His promises. Hope is a competent expectation of God's promises. Hope is the confidence in the promise that He has given, that He will fulfill it, like He says in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that He who began a good work in you, will carry it to the day of completion in Jesus Christ. We come to the table to remember Christ's sacrifice, and we come to the table to remember the promises to us, but we also come to the table 
to restore our future hope. We come to the table to remind ourselves of what Jesus is going to do, not just what he did. We come to the table to restore our future hope. And there is always hope. There must always be hope. Because of the cross, there is always hope. And we must have hope. 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 So restore our future hope. So as we close this morning, when we take communion and when we come to the table, we do it to remember Christ's sacrifice. We do it to reflect on the promise and we do it to restore our future hope. But the words from the conversation between Christ and Peter still challenge me on a regular basis. And I want to leave that with this. After that difficult teaching, after that difficult part that Jesus suddenly abandons what seems to be anything reasonable and begins to instill in them communion and coming together and doing uh, uh, this in a radical, radical way. Do you want to go away too, he says. Do you want to go away? And I just can just picture Peter in my mind looking at Jesus and just saying, where would we go? To, to, to whom could we go that would give us the words of life? Where else can we go to be satisfied of our hunger, to be satisfied from our thirst? Where else can we go but to you? Because we believe, and here is what Peter says. He makes a statement of faith. We believe that you are the son of the living God. I think that we need to, in our lives, when we come into difficulties, just like we're in right now, we need to kind of look, and where else would we go? We, we can't go to the government. We can't depend on this. We can't depend on that. We can't even depend on all of our neighbors and our friends as much as we can on depending on the Son of the living God. It is part of my job to challenge you to refocus and get back when you take communion to focus on the Son of the living God. So please, let's spend the rest of our lives coming to Him. Spend the rest of our lives coming to Christ and coming to the table to remember His sacrifice reflect on his promise and to restore our future hope. Let's pray. My Father in heaven, holy is your name. I pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Where else could we go? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, bless us and keep us. May he make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lift up his countenance and give us his peace during this week, this whole week of reflecting upon what he has done. Amen, amen. I will be in touch with you very soon. Be blessed.